But we are starting tonight in Sichuan province in China. Uh, this is a map of China. Uh, Sichuan province is here. Uh, and in 2008, you might remember there was an absolutely massive, catastrophic earthquake in Sichuan province. Whole villages just flattened. Uh, the final death toll from that quake was on the order of 70,000 people killed in a single quake. That was five years ago this week. It happened not far outside the capital city of Sichuan province, which is a city called Chengdu. That earthquake was about 50 miles northwest of the capital city. So that, that quake was 2008. But then last month, it happened again. Uh, same fault line, at least we think it was the same fault line, uh, right there in the same region. In this case, the quake was within 100 miles of Chengdu, sort of in the other direction from the city, as you see marked here on the map. And while this most recent quake was not as devastating as the mega one that killed tens of thousands of people five years ago, it was still a big quake. It killed something like 170 people. So this is not only an active earthquake region in Sichuan province, but it's a place where even very recent quakes have been not just large, but deadly. And if you live there, if you live in Chengdu, having, having just lived through those big quakes where lots of people died, having seen what quakes in that region could do, how would you feel about the news that the state-run PetroChina company was planning to build on that same fault line a massive mega petrochemical plant producing 10 million tons of oil and more than 800,000 tons of ethylene per year. People who have survived the Sichuan province earthquakes over the past five years are understandably a little unnerved by this prospect. They're going to build on the fault line. We know at least some people in Sichuan province are disturbed by this prospect because at least some of them have tried to protest this planned petrochemical plant. They tried online to organize a protest for last Saturday in Chengdu, but the security services kept censoring everything that people would post about it online. And then when the protest date rolled around, May 4th, uh, the police called a surprise earthquake drill for Chengdu. According to a report from the Associated Press, the police flooded the streets of the capital, thousands of police for the earthquake drill exactly where and when that protest was supposed to take place. Then three days after that, last Tuesday, uh, somebody, we, don't, we do not know who, but we know that it's a woman, we know that she lives in Chengdu, we know that she's in her late 20s. An anonymous person who has the initials BY. We did find that she found a place to safely post online her protest, her worries, her complaint about this chemical plant, and her request that please, given the environmental risk of this plant, please, should. Couldn't this decision be subject to some sort of environmental monitoring or, or evaluation? And you can see that her protest here, her complaint, her worry, is posted here in English, but it's kind of broken English. Like at the end there it says, uh, thank, instead of saying thank you. But, but the one safe place this young woman in Chengdu found to post this grievance, this call for protest, this plea for help, the one place she found online that she felt safe to post it was the website of the White House. It's on the petitions part of the White House website, the We the People thing that the White House started in 2011, where anybody can post any petition you want to on any subject. And if it gets a certain number of signatures, the White House will respond. I mean, it's, it's strange, but it is also kind of moving, right? That somebody, even in another country, looks to our country, looks to our government as a place where they can be safe airing grievances, where they can safely protest, even if they can't protest safely at home. What ends up being scary about this is that the young woman who posted this petition at the White House last Tuesday, she never posted her name. She never posted any identifying information on herself. She just did it under her initials, anonymously. But by the end of the week, in China, the internal security police were knocking on her door. Imagine how sick, scary that must be. How did they find me, right? And when the police knocked on her door, uh, she posted on the Chinese version of Twitter, which is called Weibo. She posted on Weibo, I will be out to have some tea. If I should not return in two hours, please report me as missing. Associated Press article about her noting today that saying I'm going to have some tea is a widely understood euphemism in China for I am going to be talking to the police. And obviously by saying if I'm not home in two hours, report me missing, she was afraid that she was never going to come home. Well, she did come home. She is safe. Uh, and she is brave enough to have done an interview with the AP by instant message about what just happened to her. What happened to her after she posted that thing on the White House website. And that's brave if you think about it, right? Because she knows that the police know who she is. They already found her in person and questioned her. And she is still willing to talk to the press about what happened. 
the White House didn't turn her into the Chinese police. I mean, maybe you believe there's some great conspiracy here. But the White House says, listen, we don't collect any information on who posts things at the White House website. They said they certainly did not hand over that information to anybody, most especially the Chinese government. But the Chinese police were able to follow the trail from her to the White House petition and figure it out. And when the AP reporter called the Chinese police to get a comment about what they did, hey, wouldn't you know it? Turns out that part of the police has an unlisted phone number. That part of the police, uh, they do not talk to the press. And this is not the first grievance from China that has ended up getting posted uh, at our White House website. There's a petition that has a ton of signatures on it about an unsolved crime in which a Chinese student was murdered about 18 years ago. Uh, there's another petition now about another petrochemical plant being built in another city under similar circumstances in another province. There actually was a street demonstration about that today in China. But, but whatever you think about the individual grievances that Chinese people are airing through our government, through our White House website, through what we take as almost an online gimmick, it is kind of a bracing reminder that this is a really important, important part of, of what we have to offer the world as a nation. I mean, yes, we are a big and rich and powerful country, but we are not the only big country or rich country or powerful country. I mean, China is way bigger than us. <laughs> we may have the biggest economy in the world, but China has the fastest growing big economy in the world. If our brute strength is the kind of thing that we think is always going to set us apart, A, it's not always going to set us apart. And for the way we like to think of ourselves, the real and best things we have to offer the world, you know, it's the stupid name for that online gimmick at the White House website. It's not brute strength, it's we the people. It's our open government. It's about having a government, having a whole structure in this big, powerful country of ours where we get to air our grievances and seek redress of our grievances. That really is the best thing that we have to offer. That is the best thing about us. It's the defining thing of us. And, and the reason that no other big, enduring country has that in exactly the same way that we do is because it's really hard to keep, especially over time. I mean, there's every incentive in the world, there's every pressure in the world for whoever holds power to try to stop other people who have less power from bugging them from complaining about them and exposing what they're doing wrong and demonstrating against them and making counter arguments against their arguments, making fun of them. People in power inexorably want to use the power that they have to stop other people from bugging them. Universally, across time, across personality, across ge geography, across culture. And that's why it's so important that our protections against that, our constitutional protections that keep our government open, that keep our system free, that keep our press free, our constitutional protections that protect those things are so blunt and so obvious and so inarguable. It's the clearest thing about us, right? I mean, representative democracy and free speech, that's pretty much what it boils down to. President Obama said today that that is the whole reason he got involved in politics in the first place. We also live in a democracy uh, where a free press, free expression, uh, and uh, the open flow of information helps hold me accountable, helps hold our government accountable, and helps our democracy function. Uh, and, you know, uh, the whole reason I got involved in politics is because I believe so deeply in that democracy, in that process. Obama speaking today, and he's, he's right about his own articulated history. He has been making the case about the importance of our open government from the very beginning. It was certainly a big part of why he ran for president. I'll make our government open and transparent so that anyone can ensure that our business is the people's business. Now, Justice Louis Brandeis once said, sunlight is the greatest disinfectant. So, you know, that's part of why uh, we've had so much trouble, is we haven't invited the American people to participate in the process. That's why I always focus on accountability and transparency in our government. That is how he ran for president. And President Obama hearkened back to that today when he got asked at this press conference today about the fact that his Justice Department, on its own volition, without ever going to a court, monitored all the phone records for two months from the Associated Press DC Bureau, New York City Bureau, Hartford Bureau, Congressional Bureau, and the work phones and personal phones and cell phones of AP reporters and editors. So anybody who was trying to air their grievances and hold their government accountable by talking to that part of the press in April or May of last year, if any reporter called you as a source from any of those places over that two month period, the government has your number and knows you've been talking to the press anonymously. 
The AP may have told you that they could protect your anonymity. They could get your story out without you ever being known to the government. It turns out they could not make that promise because the government secretly stepped in of its own volition without ever even asking a judge. And they took a knife to the ability of the Associated Press to do its work now and in the future, indefinitely. They took a knife to the AP's ability to do journalism. Any AP reporters who work in those bureaus can now write down any official story of what any official tells them is the approved truth to know about what the government is doing. But if anybody wants to speak anonymously about what the government is unofficially doing because they think that's important that that be known in our free society, that in a really important way now is gone for that part of our press. And the president today, in talking about how much he loves open government and transparency and how important that is to him and always has been, he said it in the context of calling for a new media shield law to protect reporters from this kind of reach from the government. A, some of the harm's already done. B, who knows if we're going to get a shield law. It's good, I think, that he's calling for it. It is important to note, though, that President Obama is not apologizing for what the Justice Department did to the AP. I mean, for reasons that he feels very comfortable with, this president has been very aggressive in dealing with leaks, people inside the government talking to the media. And in going after those leakers, he has been willing to ride roughshod over what the media does. We're going to be talking with Richard Engel about the president's concerns and the leak in question later on in the show tonight. You know, maybe the shield law, if we get one, will offer real protections against this kind of thing that has just happened to the Associated Press. But the other way to protect this important thing about ourselves as a country and who we consider ourselves to be as a country. The other way to protect our gold standard free press is to not just depend on the government to do it, to do it ourselves, to take care of it ourselves, to protect the freedom of our press ourselves. And that is now happening in a way that is edgy and DIY and live as of yesterday. Basic idea here is what if there was a way for sources to talk to the press without there being any possibility of their being found out for doing that. And from the government's perspective, the dangerous side of that is that it makes leakers really hard to catch. The beneficial side of that is that while investigating leakers, the government will not be able to trample all over press freedom. It protects leakers, but it also protects the power of the press to do its work. This new way for sources to talk to the press was created in part by this guy, Aaron Schwartz. He was sort of a prolific computer programmer and online activist. He developed some of the most basic ways that we use the internet today and some of the most amazing. He helped develop a website you've probably heard of called Reddit. Aaron Schwartz's mission, I guess, was essentially to give the general public access to as much information for free as humanly possible. His pursuit of that mission eventually ended in tragedy. In 2011, he was arrested at MIT for mass downloading academic journals off of the school's server with the intent to make those journals available to everybody who wanted them. The federal government decided to throw the book at him. He was facing the possibility of 35 years in prison. But before he could be brought to trial on those charges, Aaron Schwartz killed himself. This past January, he was found dead inside his Brooklyn apartment. But a couple of years before all of that, Aaron Schwartz started coding a system for sources to send information to the press with anonymity. Not even the reporters on the other side can know where the information came from. And that means if the government leans on those reporters, reporters can't tell you who their sources are because they don't know. He worked on it at the request of an editor from Wired who had grown frustrated by other failed attempts to set up that kind of information system. The system Mr. Schwartz came up with allows anyone in complete secret, apparently in complete secret, to upload data like files or photos or documents to somebody on the other end. You get a secret account. The receiver on the other side can try to write you back under your top secret name. And if you choose to log back, log back in with your top secret name, you can get that return message. You reveal more that way about what you have sent. Or if you don't feel safe to do that, you just go away. Don't ever open the return message. Nobody will ever know your identity. That's the idea, at least. And anybody can get the system themselves. It is open source. It's do it yourself. And as of yesterday, this kind of amazing thing built by Aaron Schwartz in the last years of his life, it is now live and operating at the website of the New Yorker.